Well, guys, if you can hear me, uh, some glitches here that um, somehow doesn't let me see. I wonder what it is. I wonder why the camera is not working. Let me test it. Yeah, camera is not working. Hmm. Something must have gone wrong with the camera. That's funny. Sorry about it, guys. I'm trying to fix it. Just give me a moment. Let's see if I can fix it or not. I'm going to reboot the system and then see if the camera will come on. If you guys can hear me, make a comment. Um, I will reboot the system to see if the camera starts working or not. Please stand by. All right. I wonder why it's not working. All right, let's reboot. Okay, we're back. Okay, let's see. Can you guys uh, give me a signal that you can see me as I can? Hang on. While you do that, I turn the lights on here.
All right. Christian Vasiliev. Vasiliev says hello, hello there. So I guess every, everybody can see me and hear me okay. We had a little, I don't know what the glitch was, I rebooted and everything seems to be okay. You know, I was um, doing some stuff and I thought, okay, maybe I can have spend an hour with you guys and then go for my walk. Then I noticed that it's snowing again. <laughs> I still would go for my walk, but... I guess it's the best time to spend an hour with you because right now eh, it's a bit too early and also snow is coming down hard. So it's you and I, Christian. I think we had four people when uh, I was going to reboot and then um, we don't have them here. <laughs> Let me clean the lens a little bit. All right. I guess that's better. Uh, Christian says, I'm just going to ask you something. I'm not going to be seeking attention. I just want to know. Okay. <laughs> All right. It says, when talked about guilt and forgiving yourself, and I had a scary thought about the person I hurt telling everyone that I did, telling everyone what I did and what asshole I was. Is that a selfish way of thinking or what? No, it's a legitimate concern. What if I did something bad? What if I took an apple from neighbor's tree and somebody saw it, and they're going to tell the other neighbors. So maybe for that reason, or any other reason that I, my conscience says, oh, that was not a good thing to do. Um, well, of course, that's not going to hurt the neighbor, but let's say if something that you did that possibly, maybe you took the bicycle of the, <laughs> of the neighbor, and you went for a joyride or you just wanted to go and play soccer with your friends and you kind of picked up that bicycle and, you know, you took it for a couple of days or something. And you feel guilty about it because you think maybe that neighbor needed the bicycle to go to work or something and you hurt him or whatever else the story could be. So you could be concerned about what you've done that wasn't right because your consciousness tells you that according to your upbringing and your you know, value system, that wasn't a good thing you did. So you feel that you weren't unjust and you seek remedy and you want to apologize. That could be part of the motivation. And the other part is a natural instinct of not wanting to be, um, you know, pointed out as somebody bad because um, we are always worried and fearful of something. Do I pass my exam? And uh, Is my girlfriend going to leave me? What the neighbor going to think of me? Are they still thinking I'm an upstanding person? Um, do they like me? Everybody thinks I'm a good person. Uh, you know, all these things are what the fear and worry in our heart is. So if you wanted to, your motivation to apologize was in order to make sure that such rumor or such information would not be getting out there to, you know, the rest of the block. <laughs> That's legitimate concern. What's wrong with that? It's not selfish. It's 
something that you know you're concerned about you know you want your image to be in a certain standard that you prefer it to be so but the question is why are you so concerned about being selfish or not yeah if you're you've got a friend or brother or sister or uh, you know your your girlfriend or whatever a friend around and they're like one apple and you're both hungry and you eat all the apple the whole thing rather than giving half or some part to the other person well that's bad to be selfish like that but if you're thinking about certain things that doesn't harm other people but it's good for you what's wrong with that a certain amount of selfishness is necessary in order for you to do your best or you know produce the best or bring your best outcome you have pride in that it's important your reputation it's important your way of uh, lifestyle and your values and you want to protect that and your reputation is also part of your identity and you don't want that even though it's something silly but it's the way you've been conditioned so we're talking about how you've been conditioned not that this is good or bad or should be or shouldn't be No. First of all, Christian, I don't know what you have done. <laughs> so I can't make a comment if that person actually going to go out of his or her way to tell everybody what you did or you didn't do. Uh, what motivation, what benefit does it have? What gain do they make? We don't know because I don't know the, the, the topic. But when people start saying things that are irrelevant to other people it's personal other people may endure it for a while but eventually they say oh, this person is crazy every time i see him or her he's constantly talking about this particular topic they eventually don't pay attention to it and nobody's going to remember it next year anyhow so you're a bit i think it's your ocd is hitting and trying to protect that image that you have making sure that you will be looked upon in a good light. And you need to stop thinking that it's so important what people think of you. As long as you're a decent person doing what it is that is positive and you're not harming anyone, then it doesn't give a damn who thinks what about you. Aaron Lewis 16 says, Hey, Mehran, May 19, England. Did you tackle your OCD by yourself? Yeah, I did. <sighs> But for a long time, I didn't even have a had a label for it. Like I would say, I, you know, it's weird having to wash my hands or for no reason or thinking this is dirty or putting alcohol here to clean it up and all that. I just I knew it was a bad thing, but as long as I would handle it and manage it and have remedy for it. I didn't care, especially I would try to make it that it would be private rather than like, you know, having a billboard that I'm washing my hands 50 times. So just do it discreetly. But I knew it's not a good thing. I knew there's something that psychologically I felt I had to do to feel good, which would, then I didn't know, but now I know even though I got rid of him before I knew the stuff because I was just old school and thought these are weird. I don't like myself like this. I don't want to be like it. I don't want to be the way it was that I wasn't behaving like this. So, but it was actually the fact that you do a compulsion for obsession. And every time you do the compulsion, what do you feel? <sighs> okay, everything is good now. And what does that do? Secretes dopamine. The brain secretes dopamine because something good happened. Or a good effort was made to bring balance, however you think of it. And then, so soon enough, you become addicted to that ah, feeling, the dopamine. So no longer you're doing it because it was an obsession. You're doing the compulsion partly because of obsession, partly because you're looking forward to that ah, feeling, which is the dopamine and you don't know that dopamine is secreted but just feel good and you want that feel good but in fact 
That's dopamine secreted that makes you feel good. And funny enough, naturally it became more and more, and I became more and more um, focused on doing it, if it's necessary or not, even though sometimes I was in a good mood or some kind of, you know, some kind of a balance in the psychological field of the brain that you wouldn't even do it as often. You would just pass by, say, oh, it doesn't matter. It's not dirty. And that would be good. It's like some days it was a normal kind of a dealing with these things. But some of the days, no. So when you keep doing this, partly for the obsession, partly for the dopamine, you keep doing the compulsion, and after a while, you're no longer doing it for the obsession or for the dopamine because the reward goal goal finding center and reward center and habit center they're all on top of each other in the striatum in midbrain so when you keep stimulating the compulsion doing to feel good for the obsession and then the dopamine is secreted see goal finding reward center dopamine and it also going to be stimulating without your knowledge the habit center so goal finding reward finding and habit center they're all on top of each other so when you keep doing the first two it also stimulates the third one which is the habit and after a while it becomes your habit and you no longer know why exactly are you doing this you're not even thinking about the ocd you're not even thinking about the uh, oh, feeling. You get that, but you're doing it because it becomes your habit. You just have this automatic system to do that because when it becomes your habit, you're not even aware of it doing it, but you do it. I use the example of smoking cigarette uh, that uh, Dr. Schwartz was sp uh, speaking about it in his presentation. In regard to the experiment, Dr. Grable, Anne Grable from MIT, through her postgraduate student, um, Kyle Smith, uh, an experiments, experiment on rats in regards to neuroscience of habit, that Dr. Anne Grable was the researcher who came up with the proving that the cluster of actions after done for a while and becomes a habit, it looks like one action in the brain. Cluster of actions, it comes to be seen as one action to the brain. You won't even notice that you're doing a bunch of things. You only think that you're doing one thing. And that was what, you know, Dr. Anne Grable uh, proved it by her experiences that she did. So, Dr. Schwartz used that um, experience of his smoking to show simply to the audience that he wasn't even noticing all the number of activities he would do in order to light a cigarette. He would only think that he's lighting a cigarette. But in that one move to him, which was smoking a cigarette, there were so many steps. Buying a pack of cigarette, opening the silicone around the cigarette package, tearing up the part of the package and opening it up, and then doing certain kind of action to hit it for the stick, death sticks to come out. <laughs> Take one cigarette, put it on his lips, and then flick a fire, holding the fire two inches above, you know, uh, away from his nose or his face, which is contrary to what we are uh, trained to keep the fire away from your face. But you would do all that without even noticing all these steps are being taken. You only would think that oh, I'm sleep, speaking, uh, smoking a cigarette. So Dr. Schwartz says, if you ask someone who just did all that, say, sir, are you aware that these are the steps you took? He says, no, I'm only aware that I'm smoking. Hmm? So this is what happens when you keep doing these OCD behaviors and after a while it becomes a habit and no longer you're aware why you're even doing it. That's why it's so important before it becomes a habit, you recognize it and take steps to stop it. For me, I didn't know any of these things 
I just wanted it to stop it. And I thought, it's stupid. I look stupid. I know I look stupid. I do silly things. And so that was my motivation. Somehow I was so, I guess, proud of myself that I'm this and that. So I thought, that's crazy. And even though it was crazy, I did it for a long time. And then, of course, I had all kinds of other OCDs, which eventually I dealt with them because it was old school. Just I thought of them as bad thoughts and a behavior that is not uh, acceptable. And so I dealt with it. But then when I educated myself about the whole science of it and the psychology of it and, and researched for it for you know quite a, a bit of a time, then it became all clear to me why actually one... Uh, wants to stop this and where does this stem from and how is it leading to the next step and all that and why does it linger so much and then knowing that information helps you to stop and helps you to get rid of it much sooner than if you're an old school just want to you know <laughs> use other ways to kind of uh, stop that behavior Yeah, you you obviously you're welcome to try. Why not? If you can tackle it yourself, great. But there's so much study and research available now, and uh, psychology and has advanced so much about this thing uh, that uh, you don't have to try too hard. Just learn the science of it and follow it. And then you retrain your brain and rewire your brain, and uh, through neuroplasticity, it gets it's balanced back and functions as it does and never shows up again, you know what it is. So you won't freak or panic regardless of what kind of a OCD or OCD subsets it might be. Chuckster is here, says, hey, Mary, hello, Chuckster. Tavi Sarabandi, oh, Sarabandi, is it a Persian last name? Is it Sarabandi or Sarabandi? says, you saved my life two years ago after my breakup and gave me hope and how I found, now I found an even better girl. <laughs> there we go. And I also went back to school to be a pilot. Good for you. Thank you, sir. You're quite welcome. I'm proud of you. Wunderbar. And Christian Vasiliev says, damn, the brain is on one hand, the worst thing happened to mankind. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> isn't it? And the other hand, you know, when we know how to have it behave, it's it's a machine that can be used for accomplishing many things. P. Arlo or Illo says, Hi there, Mehran. What do you think if it's worth giving a girl 27? What about your age, gender, and where you're tuning in from. First, remind me of that. Uh, I think you're a man, as I remember, but I do need your age. So what, 29, is it? And I do need where you're tuning in from. So put that information in, guys, automatically. Like, Tavi, I want you to let me know age, gender, where you're tuning in from. Chuckster, the same with you. Aaron, the same with you. Christian, the same with you. P. Irlo, the same with you. And Tavi said, yes, I'm Persian. Said, okay, good. See, I, I could tell from the last name, even though there was one extra alphabet in there. So that's why it was throwing me off a little bit. So it's actually Sarbandi, but it's spelled Sarabandi. <laughs> All right. In any case, you're welcome. Thank you for being here. Christian Vasiliev says, I'm 16, Bulgaria. Okay, thank you for that. See, one of the main reasons that I want to know your age is because I want to know if you're too young to be here or not, and if you have permission from your parents to be listening or participating in our discussions here. Um, because as you all know, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a doctor. I don't have any medical credentials. So all what I'm talking about is based on my research. The books that I've written is based on the research, on the movement of the psyche, Thoughts, consciousness, fear, desire, ego, mechanical process, order, and the 
relationship between them all, and research in neuroscience and understanding the um, mechanism that we're talking about in regards to OCD, HOCD, and many other things about the brain and the separation between brain, thoughts, and you. So, having said that, I need that information in order to make sure that you guys are aware. And Pierlo says, I'm male, 36, from Australia. Thank you for that. Tavi Sarbandi says, 25, from Toronto. Thank you for that. And Chuckster says, 37, male, Philadelphia. Don't forget to ask me where Philadelphia is now. See, now I think I got it. PA. I was going to say Pasadena as I did first time, but I think it's Philadelphia and you know, I don't think I'll fall for that trick too many times. <laughs> all right. Welcome all. Thank you for being here and keeping me company. I know you're all here just to keep me company. You're not here to benefit from anything I have to say, but either way, I, <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so we go back to Pirlo. Pirlo says, um, what do you think if it's worth giving it to girl 27 chance who broke up with me previously owing to an inability to forget her ex uh-huh jesus what a weak person now she thinks she's over but i'm not sure she might just gave up on her ex and treats me as a second option. Who cares, Pirlo? You like her? She's a looker. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have girls lining up at your door? Ah, fuck it. Then just go for it. <laughs> but I understand that she may just, you know, give up and go again. If she does that, then say, okay, bye-bye. Don't come back. Hit the road, Jack. <laughs> don't you come back no more. But, you know, don't be so rough and tough, you know. You like her, and uh, give, give her a chance. Just give yourself a chance. Give her a chance. You know, it's not a big deal. Huh? What second fiddle? What are you talking about? She's there. So you're the first fiddle. <laughs> I don't care what her reason is to be there and not be somewhere else, obviously that's the choice that works for her. Which means it doesn't matter who else might have been in the picture. You're the one who's right in front of her, her face. You're the only one that she is actually committed to be with. Hmm? So you shouldn't be thinking about who else could be her choice or other choices or possibilities for her or so on. I remember, as I mentioned this story before, when I was in college in Portland, I went to Lewis and Clark and it was a, one of the best private universities. Of course, every university is called college over there, but it was a full fledged university. And one day we had a guest as a, some kind of a event and this guest was doing a demonstration for in the hall the pool hall we had uh, a room with a nice snooker or pool table billiard table and uh, who do you think he was he was world champion in billiard at least one class of it i don't know what his name was jack white and sure enough we all gathered in that hall and I think there were about maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 of us or less or more. And Jack White came in. And I think, if I remember, it was a bit heavy set, you know, chubby <laughs> at the tummy, I believe. And then he was bringing his, uh, you know, rifle cage, you know, the cue. So he opened it up and put it together and then said, who wants to play? And we had this guy that he was always one of those guys I explained to you that anything, he was the best, he knew it, and so on. If, if you would see a hot girl passing by the campus, so, oh, wow, she's so gorgeous. And he would say, oh, I've been with her. <laughs> so I don't know if he really was or just a show-off bullshitter. So we knew 
So we had this joke about him with the other friends that if we are just somewhere, not in the school, a bunch of us without this guy being there at all, and let's say, I don't know, we were in a mall somewhere in town, and we see a pretty girl and say, wow, what a pretty girl. And somebody would say, oh, so-and-so has been with her. <laughs> so that's how we knew him as a, as a, a kind of a <laughs> bullshit artist. So this bullshit artist said, oh, I play, I play. You know, I'm very good at it. Looks <laughs> okay. I was playing with the world champion. So he... <laughs> He did a break or something, and it became Jack White's turn. While Jack White was playing, he said one thing, which I never forgot. While he was just relaxedly doing his shots, one after the other, Jack White said to this guy or to the whole audiences, I don't care how good you are. I don't care how perfect you play. I don't care how your techniques are. I don't care how impeccable your billiard skills are. I've got the cue. <laughs> meaning, meaning, I don't care how good you are. It's not your turn. I'm the one on the table. So regardless of how amazing you play, you don't have the chance right now. So sit. It's irrelevant. Same thing regardless of who she might have or who could be out there, whatever, you're the one that she's chosen. You're the one that you have the opportunity. You're the one. You're holding the queue. So don't be concerned about who is or is not out there, What, who is considered first or second or third choice. You're the only one that she's actually facing with for whatever reason and wanting to be with you. So, on that note, go enjoy yourself. I did Chuckster, didn't I? <laughs> the ugly stick is always here. Is my faithful friend is the only faithful thing <laughs> I can count on. Uh, mind you, in every live stream that I have, um, you know, ugly stick is present. So. Gee, I can count on it more than I can count on any of you guys. So, <laughs> and Alex, Alex McCat says, Alex McCat, male, twenty nine years old, six days from finding out. The girl I loved cheated. Feeling better than I did. Should I stop talking about it? How do I grow a pair, Lord? <laughs> You're looking to grow a pair, but you already have. All you need to do to look for them somewhere else. This one is damaged as far as your relationship is concerned. Because she did something that she wasn't supposed to be doing while she was committed or in a relationship. If she had broken it up and you guys had separated and then she chose to go and, you know, do the nasty with somebody else, well, fair, fair enough. But if she was still in the relationship and she did that, Mm, that's not acceptable. So therefore, you don't look for the, you don't need to grow a pair. You just need to look for your pair somewhere else <laughs> because there are lots of possibilities out there that could welcome you in a relationship and you shouldn't be thinking that this is the only game in town. It was while it lasted, but people change and when they change, it's not a reflection on you. It's a reflection on them and how they treat a relationship. And you just simply understand it, accept it, and move on. There's no shortage of wonderful, amazing women. There is no shortage. I have fallen in love in my life God knows how many times, perhaps every day of my life when I was going to school and afterwards. All it took was some girl looked hot to me, and that was it. I was, I was gone. 
maybe for an hour or two, but still I was in love all the time. And that's the beauty of it. What's wrong with it? But you shouldn't be thinking that that's the only girl that I can be in love with. Because the reasons that you're in love with the girl, at least at the outset, it's always the same. It's nothing really that special between this one and that one. Because at the outset, at the beginning, that feeling of love that you feel, it's basically lust, not love. Love comes a lot later, but let's call it love as you are accustomed to it. That feeling that, that it comes to you for the same reasons among any other uh, emotions that you express to other girls at the outset. They turn you on. You think they're hope. You think they're support. You think they are motivation. You think they're beautiful. You think they make you a better person. You think they make you more. You think they give you more value. You think it's a pleasure just to know them, hold their hands. That's, that's your program. So it's all the same. So don't think that this one can only create that feeling you know. Every other one that meets the certain basic criterias that you have, such as, you know, she should look like this or look like that or, you know, hygiene this way, clothes that way or whatever it is that you specific about it. There's so many billions of them. So there's no shortage of amazing women out there. And then you get to know them and you see, despite of the fact that you thought she's amazing, she's not worth pursuing or the other one, you say, oh, God, she's amazing, both physically and mentally. And we bond unconsciously. And that's the one you pursue. And when that doesn't happen after a while or happens and then changes, then you understand consciousness dynamically changing. So when they change, for whatever reason, it's not a reflection on you. It's a reflection on them. And wish them well. And wish yourself well as well. And go on with your life. This life is not about one relationship or one woman that that's it. If it didn't work, then I was the end of my life. Really? That's it? Your whole life is worth only about this business of sex? That's it? You can't have her? Oh, then my life is over. There's nothing else in this universe that I've been blessed to be born in, to learn, to experience, to enjoy. Uh, not in nothing. It was just this. That's a very small way of thinking. So... Don't allow that to become a real thinking for you. All right. Let me just open this window. I speak with lots of passion sometimes, and I get hot. So <laughs> cool air of snow will be good. This town is so cozy right now. It's all white, snow coming down, uh, sky is kind of um, pretty much gray. You don't see a sky. It's all this fog, like snow coming down. looks like a fog. Um, we have... Uh, Hmm. So where was I? Alex said, male 29 years old, six days from finding out my girlfriend I loved cheated. Ah, this is what I wanted to add. Feeling better than I did. Should I stop talking about it? How do I grow a parallel? Okay, we talked about it a little bit. But also I want to tell you, the girl I loved cheated, you said. You loving a girl 
doesn't mandate the girl to also feel the same way or give a certain kind of entitlement to you that because you love her, then she should also love you back or she should be behaving this way or that way. The question is, was she also in love with you? Were you guys in a relationship? Or was it already winding down? Was it gone? I don't know any of that. So the comments I made was based on thinking what I was thinking. So <laughs> I hope that helps you out. And Alex says, I haven't talked to her again, and I don't ever want to. Then okay. Why do you think you should give her a... Uh, oh, you're just asking, should you talk about it? Yeah, you can talk about it as much as you want, but limit the talking. Like, in other words, you say to yourself, okay, I will be concerned about this and ruminate about it or talk to my friends and bitch about it and show my anger about it and piss on the world and say what kind of a thing it is and all that because you don't realize how amazing this world could be and the opportunities that exist and this could be a blessing for you to move on from this and then to something bigger and better. But sometimes since you don't have the balls to move on from something that is not working, Universe nature arranges it somehow. Either she cheats it or something happens. You guys, you know, go apart and separate. And that's a blessing, but you may not see it at that moment, but you will see it later on when you find somebody that is definitely far superior to this one. And you could have never found that one unless this one would be buggering out, which sometimes nature arranges that buggering out when you can't do it. And it's not the right decision for you, and uh, but you still can't do it. So it gets done. Now, I don't know what I was about to say. Ah, give yourself a time. In other words, do your bitching and talking and discussing and analyzing it, let's say, for a week. Then be done with it. Because then you do that more then it starts forming your brain into a habit of talking about it. You don't want that. You just want to vent out. Venting out has a limitation, has a time span. So I vent out for two days. I vent out, talk about it all the time, or a week, whatever. But done with it. Because you keep doing it, then neuroplasticity in a negative way happens, and you become really good at thinking about it and constantly you want to continue thinking about it and you don't even know why you're talking about it. But it becomes your habit. Don't allow that. Mm -hmm. So give it a time period. And in that time period, not all day because you got work to do, other things you got to accomplish. So it's okay. From, hmm, I don't know, 5 o'clock to 10 o'clock at night, I exhaust myself by that. Or 5 o'clock to 9 o'clock or 5 to 7, you know, like a... Like a theater, like a movie. It's got a, it's got a time to start and finish. You've got to have a time to start and finish this rumination or analyzation or bitching or whatever you want to call it. Or being a pissed off, you know, um, mode. And then the next day, again, a certain different schedule, but not all, all day, whole day. And after a week, you just look up, done, I'm tired of it. I've exhausted all these. That's it. Then done with it. Move on. And Christian says, my therapist would ask, why would you ask someone that? Someone what? What? Um, because she's telling me I seek attention. I think she's right. I don't know what the story is, but, you know, yeah, it's uh, very possible that one is trying to seek attention. I don't know what the circumstance is, so I can't make a comment on it. And Mona is here. Says hi, Mayor and June. Hello, Mona June. How are you, dear? Um, good of you to join us. Thank you for that. Alex McCat says Los Angeles. 
Los Angeles, okay. And Chuck still says, I would say it doesn't matter how good you are with the ugly stick, but you have <laughs> possession of this stick. Exactly. So watch it, Chuck's there. I'm the only one who has access to this. So. <laughs> All right. And John G. That's a new uh, name, I think. It's the first time you're here, John. Or John, is it? Is this J O N? John G. Says it's been three months. John, I need gender, age, where you're tuning in from. Which country, age, and your gender? I'll get back to your question right after that. Alex McCat says, amazing. Thank you, Miran. You're quite welcome. Amazing for what? But you're welcome. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Okay. I got it. Yeah. And uh, John says, I'm 35, New York City male. Thank you for that. And John says, it's been three months and I keep stalking my ex and making the ending worse and worse and scared her six foot slender model look what and worse and worse scared her six foot slender model look will be very hard to replace plus her good qualities that I only focus on. Well, if the qualities were good, she's beautiful, you say, and the qualities, you say qualities were good, then why are you guys not together? So the qualities cannot have been good. And even if you're not thinking about the, you're only thinking about the good qualities, there must have been enough differences and or bad qualities in your standards between you two that it resulted in not working. So you can't say that um, it's been a good relationship and the quality has been good. If everything you say is true, then there's no way you guys would not be together. The fact that you guys broke up, that means that it wasn't working. There were reasons for it. Whether you focus on them or not, it's irrelevant. Facts are facts. You're not focusing on it, but the fact is you weren't bonding on conscious level. So who cares that you're not interested in focusing on the actuality of her and you only see the image you have created of her because of her looks and the model, six feet and all that so forth. All that structure of beauty and six feet and long legs and high heels and all that is not going to do a damn thing if the consciousness cannot bond on that level. If you guys cannot share same values and compatibility on the conscious level. And obviously you guys are not. And that's why it's not working. So I don't give a shit. She's six feet, eight feet, five feet, six feet. Six feet? I said the six feet. Five and a half. <laughs> it doesn't matter. She doesn't make you feel good. She doesn't make you feel more. How? By the love and attention and the support and encouragement and motivation that she can, one can bring to you. So you got to judge her on the basis of these things. Can she do these things? No. So what is it that you like about her? Well, you know, she's nice sometimes to me. She smiles. The smile is amazing and turns me on. Okay, great. You can watch a movie. She could be a, there could be a beautiful actress and can turn you on. What does that do? That picture in the movie and her not having any further bonding on conscious level is the same. It's irrelevant. It's just a picture. Hmm? Cut out cardboard picture of her. Beautiful. So what? What is it? What what does it do to my life? Nothing. So if the qualities are not there, I don't care how beautiful a woman is. You only need a woman to be beautiful enough to create certain kind of a excitement in you. It doesn't have to be perfect in everywhere. 
the height this, the nose that, the face this, the hair that, the smile, the teeth, the legs, this. There are few things that makes us really excited about a woman. And that few things combined with the beautiful attitude, meeting our standards or each other's standard, compatible unconscious level, that's going to be good enough to build something. But you want to go for beauty, there's no end to it because there's so many beautiful women. One is not more beautiful than the other. It's just different. And that difference translates to you as if it's more beautiful. It's not. It's just different. But they're all beautiful. So first of all, all women are beautiful because, you know, they are. But you don't have to constantly look for the most beautiful one. And I can't replace that face and that height and the model. So what the fuck is this business of, oh, she's a model. Big fucking deal. She's a model. She could be an amazing person or she could be as stupid as a rock. Being a model is not a credential of a special ingredient to build something, structure something, construct something. Being a model is means someone was built, born with that body. But you don't have a relationship with the body. You have a sexual intimacy with the body and that they're visual and that could have a lot to do with sexual intimacy and turning on and all that. Even that will become normalized after a while and you're not that excited anymore. Even if your girlfriend is, um, I don't know, Virna Lisi or Raquel Welsh or Sharon Stone and anyone as beautiful as them you won't be as turned on after a few years or a year or six months when you constantly have sex. So what is it that's going to keep a relationship together? Not physical. It's going to be your cautious though. It's dynamic. It constantly can be challenging each other and complimenting each other and supporting each other and bringing psychological security to each other. The body cannot do that. It all happens in the conscious level. So if that is not there, is missing, I don't care how beautiful they are. There are women that you know, there's something about them you like, or they're not aesthetically as beautiful as a model, but you fall in love with them. What? You fall in love with the way they treat you, their character, the way they carry themselves, the way they take responsibilities, the way they affect your life, and the way how they, they, they challenge and negotiate the challenges of life. You rely on them. You can see you can build something. You can become compatible with them. All of that is about conditioning of the consciousness, content of the consciousness. So I don't care if she's six feet or beautiful, as you say, a model. Who gives a fuck? Go build a life. If she can't be, build a life, she's not meeting your expectations, your standards. You guys don't meet each other's expectations, standard, standards. Uh, who gives a shit? doesn't mean anything and remember what we always say if this wheel doesn't turn for me i don't care if it turns at all in other words i don't care how delicious this meal is if i'm not invited on that table if it's not for me i don't care how delicious it is i gotta go somewhere else and get what is available to me and that's what i'm gonna enjoy so if she's so beautiful and all that but it's not offering it to you you don't give it that. That's not the interpretation of uh, beauty. All right. Lucky dude says, male 17 from India, sir. As the pandemic is getting worse by the second, please tell us how to prepare ourselves for the future OCD thoughts. What does it have to do with pandemic? Just take care of yourselves. Do the best you can according to the advice of your parents and medical research, vitamin C, zinc, vitamin D, all these stuff. And the rest of it's the world. What can we do? Some fucking asshole created some kind of a man-made virus and we're all paying for it now. And those pieces of shit are not in jail yet. I wonder what the hell is wrong. 
And Billy Bicken or Bichon or Bicon says, Hmm, no, what? <laughs> it says, we want girls to be nice to us, but that's just Disney TV. No, Disney TV is no longer, prom I don't think they're promoting in, you know, girls being nice to guys. Mostly about being a feminist and being, hating men, in a way, in some movies or some characters that we see. So I don't see that is really entirely true okay oh it's already one hour guys all right we've got no more questions and we've already discussed for an hour so it's time for me to say thank you very much for being here giving the opportunity to share a thing or two with you I love you all. I look forward to have another live stream soon enough. In the meantime, be good to yourself and to the others. I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. Subscribe on my channel, visit my channel, and go through the videos that you might be interested in. Mindatseekstruth.com is making it one step away to talk to me one-on-one -on, -one on Skype and discuss what's concerning you. I'll talk to you soon. But we too, like the iceberg, have thousand times bigger powers that is not visible, and we must. Why? Is it something we're rambling on and I expect you to accept it? Or is there actually another power within us? Would you come and help me out? Okay. What I want you to do is put your hands underneath my arms mm -hmm. and just lift me up. There we go, okay? Now, that's my physical part, right? Same thing, again, with that. Just want to see if there's any difference. Go ahead. Now, go ahead. Now, this, go ahead, when you're ready. Go ahead. So you see, this is different than what he was doing, and I'm not really doing anything. Doing anything. You're convinced? Yeah. So are you guys convinced that there is something other than, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.